This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Maturity Investment Group is Australia's leading provider of education bonds and has over 45 years of expertise in tax and investments. The tax-effective trust-like structure of an education bond is a solution for all generations and provides unparalleled flexibility and access to deliver on-client goals, ranging from paying for education costs to family wealth transfers. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm uh, pumped to be here with the good doctor, David Dugan. Dugs is a, a business coach, he's a founder at Abundance Global um, and he's been coaching and advising businesses for about a decade, worked with a couple of thousand plus businesses, helping them successfully scale. Um, he also comes from a long background in the military and he brings that regimented uh, discipline to uh, to his style of, of uh, business coaching, which I can speak to personal uh, speak to from personal experience. Dukes, thanks for joining us, buddy. Hey, good day, Ben. Good day, XY uh, family. Mate, I'm um, I'm keen. I, I know that there are some some sort of pretty acute challenges that advisors are facing at the moment, and I'm keen to get into some of your thoughts around that. But just before we do, I, I thought you know someone that sees inside a lot of businesses. I'm keen to hear a bit about some of the trends that you're seeing in the marketplace to, to yeah, so people can learn from, from others' experience. But before we do, I know that you've just come off a, um, a 1 a.m. start for a US-based tech conference yeah. uh, you're right in the middle of. So um, I'm keen to hear, like, what are you, what are the learnings from that? That's the A360 conference for mm, tech entrepreneurs. Yeah. What, are you, what are you learning and hearing? Well, I think uh, if we take it in the context, the last few years for everyone who's a business owner has been pretty full on. Um, however, really what, what's happened with all the drama uh, that, that's occurred is it accelerated everyone's push to go to technology. People who are very, uh, in not old school businesses, but they ran it, you know, very bricks and mortar, which is totally fine to a degree. It's really pushed them into technology. And I think big the big picture was that was already happening. All this did was accelerate something that was already occurring. And I suppose the the, the trend and maybe the, the bit that is super useful for the advisors is I feel like a lot of people think, oh, we're now in this new norm. We're not. Uh, so the, there is no new norm. The, the new norm is our ability, and, and I've been very, I think, very impressed with the financial advisors within Australasia in their ability to really add value to their clients during a pretty tough time. So I said that the, the big global thing is to understand that this technology push is is going to happen a lot quicker than you think. In the same way that COVID hit us, it, there's 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 going to be more of that um, AI, uh, uh, big data, uh, the uh, metaverse, NFTs, uh, a cryptocurrency. Whether you're a big fan of it or you're not a big fan of it, or whether you think it's a fad or whether not, it is here to stay. So those things mm. are going to definitely play out. For the advisor community, if if only if only because their uh, their members or their their, uh, their clients are going to be asking questions around that. So I think that's one thing from a global place that that regardless of what you're in, we have to adopt some more technology. I think that's a change. Now let's let's take the micro of Australia uh, with the recent legislation laws that have come out. Uh, and as you know, I've got five tertiary qualifications, and one of those was a financial advisory. Uh, uh, advanced diploma and our uh, diploma, and I love the industry. I love what it was all about and what it went for. But the, the regulation, even back then, was was quite heavy. It's even more now, 
And from all the things that we've, we can see, there's roughly 17-ish thousand advisors. And some of the predictions we're sort of seeing is that over the next uh, couple of years, two and a half or so years, we're probably going to reduce down to around 12,000. Now, because people are just going to leave and there's guy, I'm not interested in this and, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, why do I have to go and do a three-year degree or whatever, whatever, it, whatever the, it ends up being. So what that means from a Australia uh, perspective particularly is you've got this decrease in advisors, but the demand is going to be equal or at the very worst equal, but it's going to be significantly more. So supply and demand means that there's going to be more people that want advisory, but there's going to be less people delivering. So on one hand, that's a good thing. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's a really bad thing. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant challenge, and that's the yep. challenge of, well, I need to recruit. I, I can't just do this on my own, and I'm going to need to bring some more team in. So these are some things that we're seeing right now in uh, that are very pertinent for advisors to get their head around. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Like I know for us that we're hiring, we've been hiring for like two years, but hiring heavily for the for the last six to nine months. Um, and as you say, advisor numbers going down, um, pool is shrinking. At the same time, uh, and yeah, there have been a lot of legislative changes. You know, it's always easy to find things to criticize in that. And I'm sure that I could if I, if I put my mind to it, but I would say that <laughs> on balance, you see that the legislation is well intentioned, um, and, and heading in the right direction for consumers. And I think that that alongside some of the fantastic innovation that we're seeing with advisors, um, the, the transition away from product focused advice into more strategic and, and high level clients or. Is, is really fostering further even the demand for, from advice consumers because they're saying, actually, wow, I didn't know that this was possible. And this is actually really great because I can save tax and support around decisions. And then I feel confident and I can buy that property. I can do those things and, um, happy days. So I think it's all happening. The bar is being lifted, which I think is, is good. It's unfortunate for some people because it means that they're having to jump through a few hoops that when they could just be focusing on helping more people. And that's really unfortunate. But yeah. what it, but the positive side of that is that it is pushing people that aren't fully committed to not be a part of this industry, which I think it's a real privilege to be able to uh, be supporting people in this way. So if you're not prepared to, to do some work to, to, you know, I, I suppose, um, tick those boxes, then I'd say that it does show a bit of a, a lack of commitment there. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the, it's a bit of a, a purple patch for advisors and certainly the conversations that I'm having with advisors and what I'm feeling myself, it's not so much the challenge around finding clients to work with, uh, mm. although that's always something that everyone always wants more clients, but um, it's more so just like, you know, how do we work efficiently? How do we make sure that our team is supported? How do we find good people? How do we recruit them? How do we onboard them well? So um, I know that for, you know, as a as a client of yours, I know that you guys have been on this big push around team and um, done a ton of stuff over the last um uh, like, you know, three, six ish months, um, to, to help people with that. I'd say maybe that that's a, a good place to start. Like, what do you think? Yeah. What are the big things that people should be thinking about to nail it in that space? It's great. I think one of the good things is that with all the things that have been going on and are still going on, it gives us an opportunity to really look at why we do what we do. So I'd like to go through and, um, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a dot point just on what we've seen uh, here around. Here are some things that, that we've seen really work really well in right now with advisors right now. First thing is, and even though it sounds simple, I know people forget this. So uh, for those who are listening, please write this down. Uh, and that is, first thing is, remember why you started or why you chose to be in this uh, incredible, amazing profession. Like what was it? That was your vision. What inspired you, even if it wasn't to be an owner, even if it was, I want to do this as advisory, it's really important right now to tap into what it is that you did. Now, it's going to be beyond just money because you can go out and do lots of things to make money. But if you're listening to this, you've decided you wanted, you wanted to become an advisor for reasons. The first thing is to tap into that. And then from that, and think of we, you know, we call that our grand vision. Like, think about that. Well, what's the difference I want to make? You know, what, and one of the great things about the work that you do as, as advisor and, and XY, uh, and also I would say the work that we do are helping support and coach, uh, uh, small to medium sized business owners is the impact we make is significant. 
Like we, we, like we don't just help a single person, but their partners, their economic community, their families, and help to create, as we call it, intergenerational wealth. But we've got to remember why we're doing it. And then, uh, and then who do you want to champion? Like who do you want to be the hero uh, for? Who do you want to go out there and champion? Now, for us, it's small to medium-sized businesses uh, that have a, uh, you know revenue from half a million uh, a year to 10 million is the sweet spot for us that we love working with. So I go for an advisor within the industry. Who do you want to? Who do you want to actually work with? Now, Ben, I know how to work with you. Well, you do work with a variety of different people. But you have a particular niche of people that you know that you're very, very good at working with. Deliver an amazing result. Fair call. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so you go right. Okay. Once you've done that, and that shouldn't take too long, is then we're going to think, and, and before we talk about team, is we actually go upstream a little bit and talk about the product offering. Here's the, the, the catch I'm seeing is too many advisors are still stuck in the old paradigms of how to do uh, uh, the advice work. They're, uh, they're, not, they're, uh, they're unleveraged. In fact, they've got a very unleveraged business, and what's going to happen for them over the next couple of years with supply and demand going the way it is. Everyone's going to think, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be good. You know, it's actually not. What they're going to do is they're going to create a business that's going to be golden handcuffs, a business mm-hmm. that they come to hate. And I've, I've had plenty of people come to us going, look, everyone thinks I'm winning. Everyone thinks I'm going great, but I hate it and I hate working in it. And, you know, the saying that you've heard us say, uh, Ben, is no, no business owner will grow into pain. So if you're already working 50 hours a week and the idea of getting more work seems like I want to make more money and it's going to be great, but no one's going to go, oh, I want to double my business, I'm going to put in 100 hours. So yeah. unconsciously, unconsciously, that's what people do and they start to, to self-sabotage. They don't reply to emails as quickly. They don't follow up a lead as quickly. So find out who, who we really want to serve. Then the next part of that is well, let's have a look at the product. Now, that does take a little bit more than this conversation here, but we're going to dial in a product and go, this is what we're going to do and then leverage that there and how can you be the heart surgeon in that work? The reason this is important is because that goes to the next thing around talent, that just know that we need to use technology in the solution as much as we possibly can. And Mm. the business model and the pricing model around the product offering needs to be appropriate for the value you're delivering. And I think at the moment a lot of people are still in an old school methodology and, and not working. Did you want to sort of... I know you've done a lot of work on this and you've done an incredible job uh, as, a, as a lead on this, Ben. Any comments you want to throw in around that one? Yeah, look, I think for us that, what, like, and I would say I always thought that we were pretty efficient with, with what we did, but we do deliver and I think a lot of advisors are moving towards a higher touch, higher fee model. It's partly as a result of the significant uplift in, you know, licensing requirements, licensing costs, administration requirements, compliance requirements, like all of those things yeah. means that unfortunately, unfortunately for the people that can't afford it, like advisors just need to charge more for um, for advice and it's pushing people up the, uh, the value chain so that they can charge more appropriately. So we, we have always been doing that and I felt that our model needed to have a lot of, you know, one-on-one FaceTime contact with our advisors. And it, it does to a certain extent. However, um, one of the things that we're focused on as part of our uh, work over the last probably 12 months is saying, okay, what is the scalable unit for, for the advisors? Okay, how long are meetings? What are we delivering? How can we get to that outcome without without spending as, as long sitting in a room because what and what we what we've been able to do as a result of that is we've probably cut at least a third maybe up to a half out of our advice um, delivery timeline which essentially means that our advisors can deliver 50 percent more clients so it's great yes we need to recruit more people and we're still recruiting more people and we need to onboard them and do all of those things but if you can get 50 percent more clients out of your existing team then you know, you only need to recruit 50% or 50% fewer people, if that makes sense as well. So yeah. I think everyone, yeah, that there's always more. And I know that for us that there's definitely more that we could do, but um, and we will do. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think technology is helping. But even just looking at, like, what are the outcomes and how, what are the other ways that we could achieve those outcomes without having to sit in a room necessarily? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you, you know, you've doubled by doing that, you'll do, you've doubled your capacity which is great. And I think the biggest thing we see as challenges with uh, with advisors is 
that they uh, they end up becoming the biggest they end up being the biggest uh, you know uh, uh, value in the business, but they become the biggest bottleneck, and they've just got to get out of, they've got to get out of the way of their own business and let the business thrive so it can actually deliver what uh, what what it can for them. So that that kind of moves in just this conversation. Now, if you let's say you you've got your product and you've got that you got that moving. There's a little bit of a transition that's required, and that does require a bit of a mindset, uh, an uplift of mindset. And uh, you know, there are some tools, there are some templates, and things we we do on that. What we find is that sometimes, because of the desire of the advisor to add lots of value, they well, they want to be even the ones who say that they're leveraged, they're generally not. Uh, they, they're still answering lots of the questions of their team. So what I thought I'd do, just as a quick fix, something that is. is the, the the community is listening to this right now. Um, what I'd love to do is give them a real quick fix that will save them at least a couple of hours a week in on average. Would that be okay if I just take them through this? Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, it's a really simple formula. I'm going to give the cut down version because it's easy to remember. That uh, the problem that we see is a lot of uh, advisors uh, and owners of businesses are still answering too many questions in their business. That's number one. Number two, what we find is they are also finding that it's like, man, I feel like I feel like I'm the only brain in this business and, and everyone's kind of like doing the menial task and coming to me to ask questions. And the, the saying we have on that is octopus syndrome. That is, there's one brain, lots of tentacles, and everything sucks. And they also go, well, the, the, the team are just not stepping up and, and owning things more. Now, a lot of things, the reason that occurs, if you've got the right team, uh, right people on the bus, is because... Uh, they've been conditioned that way. So one of the ways to get around this is use one of the strategies we call 131. And 131 helps to educate your team to help them to think. Uh, and it's really, really simple. When, and I learned this when I was in the military, uh, as you know, my background uh, was also as a dentist. And so I was seeing patients all the time and, and my, my troops would come in and go, hey, sir, can you do this? Can you do this? And I'd be answering all these questions and go, this is just too much. I can't treat a patient, answer all your questions. And so the, that's where 131 was born. And that is when someone in your team comes to you with a problem, that's the one, we have got one problem, uh, what we want to do instead of them throwing the monkey on you is for them to keep that monkey. And how we get them to keep the monkey is to actually ask them the question, what's the problem? What's the, what's the real issue here that you're wanting to solve? That on its own is enough for someone to go, I don't know, I'm just having like a bit of a blab. I'm feeling irritated. Someone said something I didn't like. Okay, so what's the problem here? That's the that's the one. Then the next thing is uh, the three is their job is to come up with three solutions. And the people go, what do you mean by that? It's like, well, there is the example here. I remember uh, where I, the very first time I created this, I had someone come to me and say, look, there's someone at the front counter. This is as a, as a dentist. And they said they're complaining because they thought they had an appointment. They got an emergency and they want to be seen now. And my question was, what's the problem? Oh, well, I just need to, I need to, I want them to go away happy. Okay, cool. So what are your solutions? Huh. And the, one of the key things here is to help your team to come up with solutions if they don't come up with it. Now, if they don't, they go, I don't know. Yeah, cool. Come back in five minutes. Let me know what some of your solutions are. You can't let them off the hook because you're not allowing them. It's a bit like a baby who's starting to walk. Every time they're about to wobble, you go and grab them. They don't, they don't get the opportunity to fall. I don't get mm. to and the, in, when you're doing solutions, like well, what else? What else? Now, if they, uh, one thing to keep in mind with, with providing solutions: if you only give you one thing, then there's no, there's no, uh, there's no solutions that are being put into place. There's like one, one thought. If you got two, you got a dilemma: this or that. So that's why three is a really important number. So you actually do really do have choices. One of those choices is you can choose to do nothing. But it's got to be deliberate choice, not burying the head in the sand. It's like, I don't want to do anything. It's like, I oh, know, you know what? We're going to leave it. We're going to, we're not going to do something about this. We're going to wait and see. We're going to review one problem, three solutions. And this next part here that really brings it in is to ask the person, what is your one recommendation out of the three, which is the one that you think is going to be the one that's going to be the key one. And the job of the owner or the leader is to let them do that thinking and Chances are they're going to, if, especially if they're not as experienced, they'll come up with a solution that's probably not going to be the one that you would do and probably not as good as what you think. You've got to let them go with it. 
you know, let them go with it unless it's going to be someone's going to hurt someone or it's going to be something that's, uh, you know, really off. off. You know, it's really going to complete, completely change their financial future or something like that. They're obviously not there. But you'll let them sort of learn to fail because what that does is allows a sense of autonomy to them to own their mistakes, and that's where the biggest lessons and learnings are. Now, you only need to do that a few times to have the team really sort of pick up the gear. The way I love to bring that in is to take the, take the team through that activity and actually ask them uh, as a training, go, hey, guys, this is what we're going to do going forward, one, three, one. Maybe you have a problem, we're going to ask the problem. Here's your three solutions, and I'll ask for your one recommendation. Uh, so that's one, three, one. That's a great, uh, a great little uh, uh, one of the hacks that we've, uh, we've built. And as you know, we've trained people on that can really help people to get a lot more leverage very quickly, but also uplift their whole team. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that. And it actually works on partners and children. As well. <laughs> I've been trialing that one out at home. It's like, what are our options? What do you think we should do? Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, but I love that for, for teams in particular, that you're right, that it shows that you are also, like apart from you not being having to be the one that makes the decisions and, as you say, carry the, the monkey, it also shows that people that you are behind what they think and um, uh, it is a mechanism that you can use to to coach and develop them to be better problem solvers um, in their business yeah. as well. So I love that. I yeah. think as well that that and that I don't know if it's related, but I feel like another iteration of this, which I know that you um, you've taught us about and it's been a real game changer, is the the concept of the executive leadership team in, in a business. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about that and how? So yeah. I know that a lot of these growing advice businesses are going from that, you know, small sort of micro business where you are, like, like you say, in that octopus mode where you, the, the, the founder or the couple of founders are the, are the people that are responsible for making a lot of those key decisions. And for us, it's been a real game changer to have, um, you know, empower key leadership team members to then mm. take more responsibility and ownership and, right. you know, free us of yeah. having to do that. Can you talk a bit to that and how people can actually make it happen? Yeah, great. Uh, look, I'd say typically the advisors that we we speak to, they've already they're they're smart dudes and dudesses. There's usually one or two key advisors, every, uh, and then there's got they've got some uh, support advisors. Uh, that you know they're usually seven figures or just hitting that 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 category, and they're going, oh look, I've kind of dialed a little in. I've got you know the businesses the businesses is sweet. I've I sort of built it out, and the answer to that is no. You're just at the point of beginning. That's the that's almost the rite of passage to get to the place that you can actually you can actually really build a business. Because what we'll find is that there's still massive key personal risk. Even if they go, oh, I went away for three weeks and everything is okay. It's like I bank guarantee if you went to sell your business, they're going to tell you you've got a massive key personal risk that's sitting in that in that business. So, so what do we need? What do we need to do around that? Um, and how do, how do we build that out? I think we do just go oh, uh, a step before that event, and that is to uh, again, we talked about the, you know what what who we want to serve, like what why do we get out of bed? Who do we want to work with? What's the product offering that's for them? And then the next part of this is what does the team need to look like to facilitate that offering? That's a, that's an uh, important point. Now, based on that, based on that, there it'll help you to work out what we call the key seats. And Jim Collins wrote about so it's his specific specific language and that is the key seats on the bus now it's not every role in there but it's actually working out the key, you know your, your organization chart and then the key seats now the biggest shift happens in a business and not just the value of the business but the valuation that comes off the business is when the you know if we look at and there are lots of books out there lots of theories around this right you know you have this person who's the ceo and then you have a general manager or the visionary and the integrator and then there's the rest of the team the only thing I don't really find that's I don't find any really great scalable businesses have done that. I, there are, I'm sure. I just don't have, don't meet many. What ends up happening is you end up having the bottleneck go from the the person who founded it uh, to the general manager, and then they end up just getting as stressed out as anyone else, and you burn that burn them out. So what's the biggest shift? The biggest shift, particularly when you see the business when they've just hit the seven figures, and 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 they're like, okay, well, I've I've, I've reached this place of. Uh, my individual brilliance has got me here. And now I'm starting to get things a little bit shaky. So the key part of that is the decision making up until then is usually one or two people in the business who 
who are making the key deci- decisions in 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 where the, stri- the not just the direction, but some of the most you know some of the important decisions that are happening you know month by month in the business. And a lot of that is the structure that they set up their business. So what we see is the biggest shift is when we delegate the decision making to the executive leadership team. Now this is a really really important point. Let's say. You know, is where you we, there are different areas in a business. You've got your lead generation, you've got your conversion, you've got your your customer success, you've got your operations, you've got your you know admin finance. So you, you know, uh, which is part of the operations there. So just look at all these different areas. You might have heads of departments for all those areas, and a traditional chart would have you know CEO, general manager, and all these heads of departments. Okay, the distinction around executive leadership team is there'll be a number of people and each business can be a little bit different. Might be three, might be four, might be five, depending on the size of the business. Could even be six, depending on, you know, bigger businesses. It could be a representative from each of those, uh, each of those, uh, 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 what we call them, engine rooms or departments. Um, it doesn't have to be one person representing each though. But what happens is that, that now forms up a different team. That team, that team, makes the decisions now they have some mandates and they have some principles that the ceo or the owner has gives them but the really big distinction is collectively they make a decision not representing let's say they're the marketing person not representing marketing or not representing the the delivery you know the customer success area or, or, or admin they're making decisions representing the business as a collective group what's going on here what's going on here what's going here now when that shift occurs that's when we see that's when we see the businesses really, really pick up. And more importantly, it's not about it's not just about the money. Yeah, you make a lot more money doing it, but the biggest shift we see on this Ben is that we're leveraging the the founder, especially one or two of the founders, the owners, we're leveraging their time. What we see most advisors get to a certain area, they cap out because they just can't leverage anymore. And this is one of the key strategies uh, to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I know that that's the the thing that that I have been facing that you you do that there's only so many hours in the day and especially when you're you might have great people that are and when I built the business it's like I hire because I need a great power planner I need a great advisor I need a great associate and you end up with this I think you might have said this actually it's like you've got an army of followers or something and it's like you're still the person yeah it's there. like yeah, I think it's a, it's a Jim Collins quote that you would have heard me say and that is you end up being the guru with a thousand helpers yeah, exactly. Which is which is okay if you if you're running a half million dollar business or um, you know in those earlier stages. But when you start getting to that more you know bigger business, you've got more stuff going on. That it's just more things that you you need to keep across, and you know that takes time to get there. And then you go, shit, I've been at it for so long now. It's like it's just it <laughs> gets exhausting. So, I, so how, how, how do people start with that? Yeah, you- yeah. So that I thought you were going to say that because what. Uh, you don't start off building, well, depending on how you want to fund it. Let me, let me just say this. I, you know, most people we work with, uh, you know, we're not working with people that have got a million dollars in the bank and going right, oh, as in, they've got a million dollars, they're going to invest in the business straight away. You got, we're going to bootstrap it all the way through. And then, by the way, I like it that way. That'd be my choice simply because you're actually more, uh, lean on the way you think, you're more agile and you can work, you can be more innovative on it. So I think the part of it is just understanding there's a thing called the lifestyle, uh, life cycle of business and just understanding where you are and what you need to be doing. But what we need to be doing is a process called capacity planning. Something you know to have taken you through a number of times in this as well is you've got to do a process of capacity planning and going, okay, what's the goal in the business? What's the revenue and profit we want to pull out? What's the product we need to sell? And then we, what, what we do is we've got to map the team and the, the map the team for where the business is at. And you do need to hire ahead of. Uh, you do need to hire ahead of when you need that the demand, and to do that, there's just a simple, pro- well, simple but not easy process of doing capacity planning. So uh, the, the the really short answer on that is you've got to do it in stages, unless you want to put a heap of cash in and uh, and, and and basically buy the people right from scratch. What I would say though that that so there is a process, there's a part that you go through on that, regardless of what size business that someone is right now. What can they start on straight away? And I think this is the biggest, if I could, if I could leave this as one of the biggest messages for the XY community is most people understand marketing. Most people understand recruiting and they recruit when they, someone leaves, they go, oh, we, we, we're now, you know, 90% capacity. I'm really busy. I now need to recruit someone. 
okay, that that there is the old world thinking and that's what's going to have uh, advisors uh, end up hating their businesses. Uh, we cannot do that anymore. What we need to do is use the same psychology that we have for marketing for clients as we do marketing for team. Now, we call it, we've got a process called the six-step talent acquisition plan. So it's talent acquisition. And the saying, you know, the, the saying people have is, you know, always be selling. Our message is always be recruiting. Even if you don't need them right now, you can have them in the hopper. You can warm up. Hey, in six months' time, we'll need you. Let's keep on the conversation going. You need to have the people ready before you actually need it. Now, there is a, there are steps and processes, but I think the shift in mindset is the biggest part of this, is just to make sure that you think of your, you think of your marketing budget. I would put the same, if not equal or more money into my team uh, acquisition as I would into, or I can tell you right now, our team acquisition budget is three times more than our lead generation uh, funding. That's to give you an idea of uh, the focus of where we are on that uh, uh, phase because the, the massive shortage of people is not just in advisors, what's going on in uh, skilled labor is going to get um, more and more. So if people can just take this, okay, I really need to treat this team acquisition, uh, uh, I really need to treat this as, as, as a whole marketing and need to step it up then, then, um, then I'm be super duper happy because in about six to 12 months time, we're going to really, if everyone thinks it's bad now, it is like, this is just, this is just a warm up. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that we found is that we've been taking that approach that always always be recruiting is that you talk to people and then you start to see opportunities for how they can fit into the team. I think having that clear org chart and the future org chart is really key for that. But you, you can see that people start to get positioned and then, you know, obviously and we've got a recruiter that helps us fill some roles and it's great, but it is really expensive. So the more you can do yourself and um, keep your, your ear to the ground for those opportunities, the easier. Uh, so just on that, probably the, the uh, you know, the recent data on a, on a tech perspective is it's actually, because even though wages uh, are looking like they're coming up a bit in most industries, what we've found is the more, the more youthful the person is, uh, they in the age bracket is it is is less about the money than what people think, but it's more about the opportunity and it's more about the ability to serve and they're more passionate about the 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 you know like who the people that you're working with and the, and the mission they're very 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 much more mission focused and so that's the reason why this marketing for team is so important because we want to have a place that people go oh I love what they're doing I want to be part of that. And it's not about, it's not just about the dollars. It's, um, uh, and the recent, uh, recent studies are saying it's actually more about the sense of purpose than it is actually the cash. And the other, the other side of that is that if you're paying less, and I get that you do, do need to pay competitively, obviously, but when you find talent when they are, you know, if you're paying a slightly lower salary than what they could get somewhere else, then you know that they're committed to and behind that brand and vision, which I think is, um, is a really important thing, you know, for, especially for growing businesses that you do have people that are that are all in um, as well. Obviously, it saves you a few bucks, but it's probably more about knowing that you've got people that are, um, you know, be, behind the cause. Um, yeah. Dukes, I I could uh, and and probably will uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, chat, chat to you about this for hours on end, but uh, mate, really appreciate you sharing your insights. For people that are keen to learn more about you guys and, and what you're about and what you do, what's the best way for them to learn? Yeah, great. The best way is going to our website, which is www.abundance.global. That's all it is, abundance.global. Go on there. Have a look at some of the, uh, there's some great free articles and information on there, some videos. And if you want to connect with us, you can uh, connect with us as well. And uh, uh, what I'd do is I'd be more than happy for uh, anyone in the XY advisor community, either myself or one of the coaching team. Uh, if they want to have a quick chat just to go through where they're at, I'm happy to do that. We've got some great events that are coming up that go through these things. So there could be some great uh, value for someone who's in that stage of like, I'm ready to rock and roll. Go onto our web uh, web page, or alternatively, if if someone wants to reach out directly uh, to me, uh, if they want to reach out to uh, my email, david at abundance.global, just shoot that through and um, uh, myself or someone on the team just organized, we can have a catch up. So I'm more than happy to help the XY community. 
Uh, so, mate, well, looking forward to those events. I actually heard that you've got a celebrity panel on at one of them, so I'll be eagerly, eagerly away. <laughs> Uh, but mate thank you again really appreciate you sharing your insights and especially after a a 1am wake up for your tech conference mate thanks thanks again and we'll catch you on the next one too easy beautiful thanks Ben thanks XY uh, family